Thank you all for attending today's First Thursday with the Sustainability Alliance on Urban Soil Health, a functional yard. And this month, we're excited to welcome our guest speaker, Jack Titchener, with Urban Soil Health and Agricultural Specialist at the Oklahoma Conservation Commission to explore effective conservation practices for any size of land and the preservation of natural resources while creating a sustainable future. So thank you for being with us today and we look forward to the insights and expertise uh, that Jack, that you have and that you'll be sharing with us on this important topic. Before we officially get started, I do wanna take time to honor the memory of the Tulsa Race Massacre. Uh, today, we acknowledge the profound significance of this moment as we pay tribute to those whose lives were forever changed and enduring impact of this tragic event. And on the affected community. Uh, in this moment of reflection, of silence, uh, let us take a collective pause to recognize the resilience demonstrated by those who endured an unimaginable suffering and loss. Through, through this silence, we convey our deep respect and compassion for, those, for their experience. So let's take a moment of silence. And today we stand united, bound by a shared commitment to fostering a society rooted in empathy, understanding, and justice. And we reflect on upon those echoes of history. Let them guide us toward building a future that embraces inclusive inclusivity mm -hmm. and equality. And thank you for taking that moment of silence for us and memory uh, and memory of those lives lost. Okay, um, again, thank you for joining us today and supporting the Sustainability Alliance and sustainability in your community. And uh, we're going to, uh, Teresa is now going to launch an intro poll. So these polls are really important to us. They really help us understand what uh, experience you're having and how we can and improve upon that. So take a few moments, answer those questions. Uh, it'll pop up on your Zoom window and while we begin. So thank you so much. Uh, the program again, um, it is brought to you, uh, to you um, by our sponsors and we couldn't do it without them. So a big thank you to the following sponsors who helped to bring us this educational opportunity and resources and community connections uh, through the screen each month. So thank you to our lead sponsor, Williams, our neighborhood partners, public service company of Oklahoma and PSO Win Choice, our community advocates, uh, Cavanta, The Met, One Oak, Save Our Streams, Spirit Era Systems, Tulsa Farmers Market, and Sustainable Advisors Alliance. So thank you to all of them for their support and helping us uh, bring this to you uh, each month. Um, and also like to thank um, my board members that have joined us here today. I know Richard Cox is in the room and Teresa Latimer Davis, and I think there might be a few others. So thank you to our board members uh, for being here. If you know them, please send them a little note in the chat of uh, appreciating their volunteerism to um, our organization, make us a stronger organization. I also want to thank my incredible and growing Sustainability Alliance team. Work hard to bring these programs. We're a busy little team bringing lots of programming and education your way. And so I'd like to say thank you to Teresa Kerrigan, Joe Maud, Morgan Fairley, Zoe McGowan, and Missy Luckenbrock. Please um, give them a little round of applause and send them a note uh, of gratitude for the work that they do. Um, um, it is uh, an honor to work with each of them. Uh, I'd also like, um, uh, if, if you're interested in supporting the Alliance, uh, we also couldn't do it without our members. So it's easy. You can, at any level, you can support the work that we're doing. If this is meaningful to you, we do need your support. And it's easy. Um, for $25 more or less, we can get your name out there showing our growing list of change makers in the community. So. Um, Please, no, no amount is too small. Uh, it all matters to us. And we are very appreciative of everybody that takes the time to support us. So um, this supports sustainability education, Bellman Awards, 
first Thursday events, B2B case for sustainability series, our scorecard program, our TerraScore app, and some of our new and developing programs like First Step. So um, take, take a moment and please um, support us if you can. You'll see there in the chat, uh, there's a way to donate today. So thank you very much. Uh, the Sustainability Alliance also has a Facebook group, help people to better connect. So uh, take a moment and uh, connect with us uh, and, uh, and share some of the things that are also happening out there in the community uh, in our sustainable, uh, with our sustainable family here. And now I'm going to turn it over to Morgan, who's going to introduce our sponsors in Digital Boots. Morgan? Hello, everyone. Thank you, Corey. We would like to start first with a video from our lead sponsor, Williams. At Williams, we're focused on adding new technology and operating practices that deliver right here, right now reductions in global emissions, cutting edge emissions measuring and monitoring, certifiable and transparent emissions data, real-time energy optimization across the natural gas value chain, integration and delivery of the fuels of the future, meeting global energy demand and global climate goals. For us, this is just the beginning. Williams, we make clean energy happen. Thank you, Williams. Next, we have our neighborhood partners at PSO. Lily and Dustin are here from PSO's Consumer Education Group, and they'd like to share a few updates with you. Uh, I'll go ahead and turn the mic over to them now. Okay, thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, Lily, are you there? Hi, let me go, let me go back a little bit. Um, so thanks for having us, everybody. Very good to be here. Um, I'm Lily, and that was my colleague Dustin. We're consumer educators here at PSO. Um, we go around to public events and educate customers on our programs and answer customer questions concerns at our booth and um, so we just educate people on our programs that we provide um, including some that are we have some sustainability efforts so some of those would include our EV electric vehicle rates um, electric vehicle chargers for uh, rebates for businesses and homes and we actually have uh, a little bit of investment in solar farms too getting a little more into that and then we also have wind farms that we are uh that we now own so we've purchased some in three about three three in uh, north central oklahoma and we actually have a program that supports the wind industry called wind choice so um it's just a way to um reduce our fossil fuel usage in our energy mix so we're about 24% wind at the moment, and that should increase in the coming years. Um, and we're uh, that'll help us reach our goal of closing our last coal facility by 2026. So, uh, so I guess we can go in, into a little bit how Wind Choice works, which Dustin will tell you a little bit more about it. Thank you, Lily. Uh, yeah, Wind Choice, it's a uh, volunteer, voluntary uh, program that we have. Um, it's just, uh, like she mentioned, we do have uh, wind farms. Uh, currently, they do make up 24% uh, of our energy mix uh, currently. And we are about to add a, a few more wind farms in the, in the coming years. Uh, but with the Wind Choice uh, program, it's just a way to uh, support the uh, wind industry. Um, and uh, what we do on that is we do purchase a corresponding amount of the renewable energy credits, uh, RECs. So you can decide how much wind you want to uh, choice, uh, choose. You can choose up to 100% if you just feel comfortable choosing 25%, 50, 75. And the cost on that have went down. I'm, I'm on it as well. I'm 100% in. And so it's on average, uh, it's about $2.50 a month. So it's really not, you know, that expensive. And, 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 and that way you can uh, support, you know, help support the wind industry. And, and, um, and since we do uh, use some of that in our, in our mix as well. And 
So yeah, it's uh, you can choose a percentage and on our website there on psoklahoma.com. You can go under uh, clean energy. You'll see the renewables section under wind and it's very easy to actually sign up online. So that's basically, that's basically wind choice. I'll turn it, I guess, back over to Morgan. Thank you, Dustin, and thank you, Lily, for sharing with us today. Definitely appreciate hearing those updates and any chance that we can give all of our viewers to take sustainability on in their day-to-day -day lives. So next, I would like to welcome our um, community advocates. First up is the Met, who offers recycling services throughout the year through their drop-off sites and special recycling events. They also proudly provide meaningful employment opportunities for individuals with disabilities. You can find out more by visiting metrecycle.com. Save Our Streams is a city of Tulsa department that promotes healthy waterways and pollution prevention through their stormwater quality program. From environmental inspections and household pollutant collections, they offer various services to help you help our streams. Get in touch via email at stormwaterquality at cityoftulsa.org. We also have the Tulsa Farmers Market. This takes place every Saturday from May to November in the Kendall Whittier District. The spring market began on April 1st and has been bustling with activity each Saturday since. If you've never been, we encourage you to make this your first season to support local farmers and makers. Also, stay tuned for an upcoming announcement uh, that we will send out in your inbox about the launch of our next challenge that will be in partnership with the Tulsa Farmers Market through our TerraScore app. To stay up to date with opportunities like this and more, go to our website, thesustainabilityalliance.org to be added to our email list. And lastly, but not least, our newest First Thursday Community Advocate sponsor is the Sustainable Advisors Alliance. Learn more about this innovative co-op financial advisor group that can help you manage your investment portfolio in a sustainable manner and provide solutions for your profit bottom line. They offer no minimum requirements minimum requirements to start investing your dollars today. Get in touch with Julie Sky to learn more by visiting their website. And I will turn it back over to Corey to introduce our guest speaker today. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you again to all of our sponsors. Uh, again, we really couldn't do it without them. And we are, but we couldn't do it without um, our wonderful speakers and, and for you all being here to get today, wanting to learn a little more uh, about soil science. So uh, I would like to, to um, introduce Jack Titchener. He is again, the urban soil health and agricultural specialist at the Oklahoma Conservation Commission with a strong passion for agriculture and soil health. Jack has accumulated years of experience and knowledge in the field. He holds a degree in agricultural science from Oklahoma State University, accompanied by a minor in agricultural business. Uh, throughout his career, he's gained valuable um, expertise through various roles in horticulture industry, including internships and work prominent in, uh, institutions such as the Linnaeus Garden and, at the, and also at Philbrook Museum of Art. Currently, as an urban soil health and agriculture specialist at the NRCS and Oklahoma Conservation Commission, Jack provides landowners with expert advice on conservation practices to enhance landscape health and vitality. He's dedicated to promoting environmental stewardship and fostering a deeper connection between people and nature, which is evident in his work. Welcome to First Thursday uh, with Sustainability Alliance, Jack. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. All right. Um, again, like I said, they introduced me. My name is Jack Titchener. I work for the NRCS and the Oklahoma Conservation Commission. I am a unique role, one of the first in the state for urban soil health. And so I travel around all over the state to many urban centers and practicing on uh, soil health. So... Again, they kind of mentioned it a little bit before my background. I'm here, I'm a Oklahoman through and through. I'm from Manford, Oklahoma. That's where I grew up. I went to OSU. I've lived here in Tulsa for over 20 years. Um, intern at Linnaeus, worked at Scissor Tail Farms for hydroponic production of vegetables. 
And then my last job before this, I worked at Philbrook Museum of Art, where I built and designed their 15,000 square foot vegetable production garden. I was also in charge of their 1,200 plus trees and all of their water features. So I appreciate you guys having me. What I do is I focus on supporting or promoting urban conservation and urban agriculture. I do on-site consultations for homeowners and producers. I provide you with resources to your districts or even people statewide. And I take the same soil health principles we've been practicing on larger producer acreage, and we uh, pare those down for uh, small scale and urban people. The science stays the same, but sometimes we apply them a little bit differently. And then I also make uh, programs, brochures, and I just do other planning assistance. And if you see kind of in the corner, that's my email and my phone number if you'd like to reach out to me. Um, so one of my basic presentations that we're gonna do here is on the urban setting and basically what we can do as far as urban conservation is concerned. So let's start at the basics and talk about what is soil. The soil is a living, it's breathing, it's a natural entity composed of solids, liquids, and gases. What does it do or what does it provide? It provides nutrient recycling, water relations, biodiversity and habitat, filtering and buffering, and physical stability and support. Five factors that are important for the formation of soil are the parent material, which means just like people, what were your parents? What did you come from? It's also the biological activity. How many microbes are in the soil breaking those things down? Your climate, we can think about a desert versus a jungle. Uh, your topography, again, whether it's a flat area, whether we're in a valley or hilly area. And then also time, young soils versus old soils. All of these have an impact on the quality of what your soil is in your specific area. So some of the physical properties of soil. These are the things when we talk about soil, it's always broken down into these three main components, sand, silt, and clay. One of the main things that you need to, re, uh, to learn or remember about these physical properties is the things that I have highlighted there, the specific surface area. We can see on the clay, it has 8 million centimeters uh, cubed or squared per gram versus medium sand, which has 45. And so when we talk about surface size of these particles, they have a direct influence on how they stack together and how they let water and other nutrients move or infiltrate through the soil. One of the things, if you look over to the right and we look at those three particles, if that in relative size, if that sand was the size of a basketball, that silt particle would be the size of a marble and that clay particle would be the size of a pinpoint. That is the difference in size between those particles. And so again, we talk about surface area. When we look at the clay with the 8 million uh, centimeters of surface area, they're able to hold on to nutrients a lot better into the soil than the sand. But as some of us know, when you get that many particles in a small area, if we have a lot of clay soils and we get a lot of rain, what does it do? It ponds up. It doesn't infiltrate through the soil. The water doesn't move through. It creates ponding everywhere. So we usually like a representation or a mixture of all of these particles, sand and silt and clay together. That is what is physically what your soil is. And so one of the things we refer to is called a texture triangle. If someone's ever talked to you and they say they've got a clay loam or I've got a silt loam or I've got clay, that means they have certain percentages of these sand, silt and clay particles that make up their soil. And so what you do is if you were to take this in and get it sampled, they would separate this out and calculate the percentage of the individual pieces in your soil and that will give you this texture. This texture is usually a permanent feature. Consider this, the typical mineral soil will take six inches deep on an acre. That soil will weigh 
two million pounds. If you wanted to change the sand content of that soil just 1%, it would require adding 20,000 pounds or 10 tons of sand to change it 1%. Now, a significant effect might be 10%, which means adding 100 tons of sand per acre. And so usually that's out of the realm of most people. So what you have is kind of what you have. And so the question I have on there on the bottom says, what texture is a soil that's 12% sand, 55% clay, and 33% silt? So we'd start with sand on the bottom and move it out to 12%, clay up to 55, and silt is 33. So that would be a clay soil. And so it depends on obviously the percentage of that sand, silt, and clay is what texture you have. Again, on the texture and particle size, one of the main things we talk about is called cation exchange capacity. Think of a magnet. If you were to zoom into the soil on the microscopic level and look at one particle of clay on the left versus one particle of sand on the right, the nutrients that sit in the soil, most of them have a positive charge. Our soil colloid or the individual piece of that soil has a negative charge. Just like in magnets, the more negative charge you have, the stronger the pull, the more nutrients it's going to hold next to it. When we look at the sand particle on the right, we can see it still has a charge, but not as strong as the clay. So it can hold on to those particles, but not as well. So, um, Sometimes when we get a soil test and say we want to change the pH of our soil, one of the things they're going to mention is called buffering capacity. That buffering capacity means how much negative sites are in the soil. When the soil has a lot of negative sites, it has a high CEC, or cation exchange capacity, which means it has a high buffering capacity which means it takes more things to change that pH of that soil because the physical particles of the soil hold on to those minerals better than the sand does. Sand has a lower buffering capacity because it's easier to manipulate the chemistry inside those particles. As I mentioned earlier, the soil is alive. One of my pet peeves is people that refer to soil as dirt. Dirt is what you scrape off of your fingernails. Soil is alive. If you were to take one tablespoon of soil, one tablespoon, it likely contains this amount of organisms in it. These organisms' primary role is to break down organic matter and obtain energy. They also release essential nutrients and carbon dioxide and perform key roles in nitrogen fixation. Microbes must have a constant supply of organic matter or their numbers will decline. Conditions that favor soil life also promote plant growth. So the healthier the soil is, the more microbes you have in it. The more supply of organic matter you have, the more that the microbes have to feed on, which will then in turn feed your plants. That's how your plants get energy is from these microbes. Unfavorable soil conditions, such as high temperatures, compaction, or oversaturation, just too wet, can injure those beneficial soil microbes and lead to proliferation of diseases. And plants that are stressed by disease are often more susceptible to insect damage. Insects are usually a secondary indication that the plant is stressed. So one of the things that some people talk to me about a lot is, especially in urban settings, is soil toxicity. So if you look on the chart on the right, some of these are some of the, mm, I would say, more common materials that you can find in urban soil. Urban areas are, are contaminated usually by um, human activity. So one of the things I always remember is 
certain houses used to be on the outskirts of town. Now they're in the middle of town. Town is kind of caught up to them. And so at certain places uh, in older communities, you could be building houses over the spots of landfills, um, treatment plants, other things. And so one of the key things that you can help identify an area of soil toxicity is actually to go to your um, county and visit old maps and look and see if the areas of where your house is and see if there could be any indication that certain activities were going on there. And so that's one of the first things that we even do as the government is go interview local residents and look at old plat maps to determine were there any residents there? What, what were people doing in that area before we moved houses in there? Um, if you think that you have toxic soil, these are a couple of places that you can get it tested. One on the right there is called Midwest Laboratories. If you look up above, that's one of their priority pollutant metal tests. And for soil, as you can see, it is quite expensive. The Oklahoma Environmental Quality will also do uh, pollutant tests, but you have to specify which pollutants you're looking for. And each one costs a specific amount of money. And so that's where we go back to interviewing people that have lived there for a while, and then also looking at old maps to determine maybe we can see if, if it was a landfill versus uh, mining or other operation, maybe which chemicals that we might be looking for. There are ways to re, uh, remediate toxic soil, and we can talk about those or some of the things that we can do with those. Um, one of the first things is personal hygiene. If you know that your soil is toxic, you should wear gloves and wash your hands well after working in the garden, to remove shoes to avoid tracking it into the house and prevent children from ingesting it. Food safety. You could remove the outer leaves of leafy crops. You could wash all the produce with a mild detergent. You could peel root crops. You could even do a plant tissue test to assess the level of contaminants actually in the produce. One of the easiest ways is garden design. It says if the contaminant is limited to part of the garden, one of the ones I consider a lot is lead-based paint. If you repainted your house and chipped off that lead-based paint, most of it is around the foundation of your house. If you cannot plant vegetables or certain things that you're going to eat close to the house and move them away, that would be beneficial. Um, let's see, be sure to allow drainage. And if, uh, if needed, you could install a raised bed, but make sure to seal off the bottom of the bed so that the plant roots can't penetrate. So when you build that raised bed, make sure you put some landscape fabric down below it so those roots can't get into the contaminated soil. Another way is also certain plants put that chemical in their cellular structure differently than other plants. If you had toxic soil, maybe you wouldn't plant a root crop such as a potato or a carrot or a beet or an onion maybe you would uh, plant maybe a tomato or a cucumber. They'll have lower concentrations because they don't put those toxins as much in their fruits. Um, let's see, soil management is another way that you can deal with toxicity. A lot of times, if you raise the pH of the soil with lime, it can chemically lock those uh, uh, minerals out so that the plant won't be able to uptake them. Um, another one, if it is necessary, you could do decontamination by physical excavation, which is very expensive. You could also do bioremediation techniques, which means planting certain plants that pull up those minerals better than others. And so we won't get into necessarily all the nuances of that, but those are some of the immediate things that you could do if you feel that your soil is toxic or you've tested it and it is toxic. <clears throat> okay, so now a few things about soil. We've learned some of the basics about it. So what, what does soil do? One of the best things I've heard from people is 
Soil is Earth's kidneys. It helps regulate many natural cycles that we depend on. And so if you look on that one on the left, the hydrologic cycle, the soil is directly responsible for the amount of infiltration of water that gets to uh, recharge the groundwater and goes into the water table. So what we're doing to that soil affects Every stream affects the ocean, affects our drinking water. And so that's why it's so important. Doesn't matter how so, uh, large or small of an area you have, if you can do some things to encourage the health of the soil and protect its natural cycling, you help protect the water. Um, another one, if you look on the right, is soil helps regulate the carbon cycle. I think all of us uh, have learned about climate change and we've learned about the high levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. And so if you have a healthy soil with healthy plants that are biodiverse, which means a lot of different species growing in the same area, that can help regulate carbon dioxide. And if we look at the graph, I found very interesting when I first started, plants exude carbohydrates through their roots to feed the soil organisms. The plants actually feed the microorganisms. The microorganisms in turn feed the plants. It's a cycle that way. And so it's very important to have a living root in your soil year round. The other thing about plants growing in the soil is native ecosystems have native plants that have adapted to the native microbes in the soil. So they share a relationship together. When you put native plants with living root systems into a, a native soil, it helps complete that cycle. It helps uh, move those nutrients in the way that they are designed to do. And so now that we've talked a little bit about soil science, and we talked a little bit about some of the things that soil can do for us, what can we do in our yard to help maintain this balance or this equilibrium. And so one of the main projects that I work on is called Yard by Yard. It's a community resilience project that's for individual homeowners that can do ecologically friendly practices that helps the environment. So I work for the Conservation Commission. This is one of our babies. It started in Oklahoma City but it's in most of the large urban areas in Oklahoma. It's specifically an Oklahoma um, project, but this is one of our mini posters. It talks about some of the benefits of what you can do to have what we call a functional yard. And as you see with Sam the Resiliency Raccoon there, off to his side, he talks about adding plant diversity, maybe doing some vegetables, um, helping support the native, pollinators and bees, and just some of the things I think that we can all connect with um, in our natural environment. Um, if you look on the left here, if you apply and actually qualify for our program, which I'm gonna go through some of the things, I'll come out to your yard and give you an attractive yard sign, give you some native wildflower seeds, and then you'll also get more alerts about educational opportunities. And so what, what is a yard by yard? What are some of the things that we look for for an ecologically friendly yard? So one of the first things we talk about, I maintain a pesticide free yard. When you spray pesticides, most of them are non-selective, which means they don't care who they kill. They kill everything. And usually the bad comes back before the good and it takes a long time for nature to get back into balance. So the less pesticides we spray on our yard, the more insect biodiversity we get, which equals healthier environment. So we divided the yard by yard into four categories. We've got soil, we've got water, we've got habitat, and then we've got food. And so this first section is all about soil. And so I believe we have some uh, links, or if not, I could send you an email and every one of these blue highlighted one is a clickable link that can take you to a land grant or some sort of research university's information on how to do a specific practice 
and what it actually does. And so one of the first ones here is we like you to use organic mulch, not rubber, not dyed. Wood, leaf, wood chips and leaves help build soil organic matter and hold moisture. Leaves are also one of the places where a lot of some of our native butterflies um, put their chrysalis out. They actually look like native leaves. And so when you pick those leaves up, you're actually destroying homes for some butterflies. One of the other things we do for soil is on-site composting. Capture organic waste. We close that cycle. When I talked about nutrient recycling earlier, these plants that have been growing in our yard pull up these nutrients from our soil. If we don't let them decompose and return them back to the yard, we've effectively mined the minerals from the soil and we took them away. If you don't bring them back, you're gonna have to bring some sort of input, i.e. fertilizer in, to bring it back to where it was supposed to be. And so if you let the natural succession of plant growth and death happen, that nutrient recycling happens automatically. Um, practice mulch mowing rather than bagging lawn clippings. Again, once you cut that lawn, if you let those grass clippings fall back onto the lawn, they decompose, they add minerals, they actually fertilize your lawn for you. You can improve your soil and plant health through compost amendments. That compost acts like a sponge. As we showed earlier, it has a high cation exchange capacity, which means when we add fertilizers, we add water, we do any of those things, it actually acts like a magnet and holds on to those things better. So we actually have to fertilize less. One of the most important things that I tell people that you can do, if you want to do anything, is one of the last things on this list. Increase your mowing height to at least three inches. Why? That grass acts as an armor that protects that soil. If you were to go down the YouTube rabbit hole, you could find videos of time lapse of raindrops impacting bare soil. It looks like an atomic bomb goes off every time they hit. When you leave that uh, three inches or more of grass over the top of your lawn or your soil, it does a lot of things. It helps, uh, helps grow those living roots. So that helps nutrient recycling. Once those root growths, it also helps what's called aggregate stability, which means how the soil particles stick together. If they stick together better, that means more water infiltration, which is good. We have to water less. So there's just a lot of benefits from just that one practice alone. Okay, some of our other categories, water. So you could do any zero escape or heat or drought tolerant plants that require little or no water. Most of those are native plants. If you were to take some of our more exotic species out of your yard and put more native plants in, I can guarantee you that you'll have to water less, which means that's a money saving for everyone. And then also when you turn your hose on, that's potable water that we can all drink. And I would much rather have water that I can drink versus what we water our grass with. One of the other things you can do is efficient irrigation equipment or controllers. Um, one of the ones I try to talk about is if you have an automatic sprinkler system, please try to install some sort of rain system or rain sensor. That drives me, that's one of my personal pet peeves that drives me nuts is when I drive by your house and it had just rained and yet here's your sprinkler on. It doesn't need to water. One of the other things you can do for water, which I see a lot, is rain barrels. Capture rainwater. Most of them are about 50 gallon size. You can get larger, but here's a little food for thought. If you take your square footage of where you're gonna capture this rainwater and times it by 1.625, that'll give you the approximation of how many gallons fall in a one inch rainstorm. You have a thousand square foot house that's 1,625 gallons every one inch rainstorm. I believe we were average about 38 inches a year of rain. So that'll tell you about how much rain you could potentially collect off of your roof. One of the other things 
a rain garden or bioswale. Again, we're, all this water is falling on our property. How can we capture it and help it infiltrate into our soil, help Earth's kidneys purify this water to get down into our water table and not run down the street and go into the stormwater system? Picks up all these pesticides, toxins, oils, everything. And somebody downstream from us has to treat that water and drink it. And so I think it's very important for our water quality. One of our other categories, food. One of the presence of vegetables, whether in ground, containerized, or raised beds. One of the things I realized about when I started growing food versus anything else, this is how I started, was growing food. And that's led me down this rabbit hole of all these things. Food is the thing that got me hooked that was interesting to me. But then I realized the mechanisms of how these soil and these plants work, and they always do it. And that was fascinating to me, so I just went further and further. The presence of an herb garden for cooking or medicinal purposes, uh, purposes is also one of the beneficial things for landscape. A lot of our native herbs are very attractive to solitary uh, pollinators, such as bees. The use of cover crops or companion plantings. Cover crops are a crop that's growing when your cash crop is not growing, the crop you really want. Cover crop allows the protection of the soil. It allows for the living roots, for that nutrient exchange, so those microbes don't go hungry. And when you plant that plant that you really want to grow, those microbes are ready to go. Um, the presence of fruit trees or shrubs. Again, we have several native producing fruit trees. Um, one of the most important things, I think, if you really want to get in the actual completing the cycle is the integration of grazing or pasture animals, chickens, goats, etc. They help add natural fertilizers and other things to the soil. We're a tall grass prairie. That's one of our native ecosystems. We grew up with bison, millions of them that would travel through here. They would tear it up, deposit all that stuff back on the top, and then leave, and then come back. And so that is part of the natural recycling that adds organic matter to our soil. Um, one of the other things that you can do is also maybe do maintenance of honeybee hives for honey production. I've also went out to people's yards that they have boxes. They don't even collect the honey. They just have them for the bees. And so you can do either or. Habitat. This habitat is usually we talk about for insects, but it can be for any kind of, of our native species. Kind of close to that water use, we talk about use of native or well-adapted plants to Oklahoma. Again, drought tolerant, um, deal with our um, soils, our actually native pollinators are used to these plants so they can get the most amount of pollen out of them. Um, there's a lot of different benefits to using native plants. Use of host plants for native wildlife. The example is milkweed for monarchs. And so there's a lot of different plants. Um, I was at a site today. They have what's called a snag tree, which means it's a tree that has died, but it's still living. That's a host plant for a lot of, uh, some of our native woodpeckers and other things. Um, some of our non-natives or invasive plant species excluded or removed from the landscape, Chinese privet, um, some of the thistles, so some of those other things that we might not want that spread quite rapidly. Lawn or turf grass areas have been reduced or eliminated. Turf grass is one of the biggest offenders of runoff. Most people do not trim it high enough. If you trim it about one to two inches, that means it has about one to two inches of roots. Those roots do not allow for much infiltration. An average Bermuda lawn is mm, slightly better than concrete. That's about it. It also, most turf grass is a monoculture. Again, our microbes like to feed off of diversity. I love pizza, but I couldn't eat pizza every day of the week for the rest of my life. And so the diversity of those plants is what these microbes feed on, which then feeds the soil. 
Um, functional flowering lawn species like clover are protected and not mowed. Again, in our lawns that we mow down, um, the soil usually has seeds that lay dormant. They're just waiting for the right opportunities to grow. If we let them germinate and keep cutting their heads off, they will never seed themselves. They will never produce that pollen that our native uh, wildlife likes to enjoy. Again, some of the main overarching subject, plant diversity, providing nectar and pollen throughout the wildlife season. The presence of native trees or shrubs creating some vertical structure. Um, certain wildlife like to hide. Certain of them, certain birds only like to feed off of the ground and they need some sort of medium between a high tree and the ground in order to feel comfortable. They will hit, they will go from the tree to that shrub, then to the ground and then back in a pattern. And so if you sometimes don't have those shrubs or some of that vertical structure, you'll never have that wildlife. The presence of bee hotels, birdhouses, and or bat boxes. Again, diversity in our landscape is key. The presence of a rock or brush pile. Most people think they're untidy. Those rocks or that brush pile looks beautiful to caterpillars, mice, insects, all kinds of bugs. And so the more diverse amount of insects, other things you have in your yard, the healthier your yard is. Oops. And so this is what I would like us to get away from. On the left, we look at it. Yes, it's a beautiful lawn. It's a nice house. Most people that drive by think that looks beautiful. Nature thinks that's ugly. It's not diverse. Quite a monoculture, not very many native species. There'll be some microbes there, but not many. I guarantee there are probably not many birds at that house. Now look at the one on the right. Look at that permeable path they have walking in. They can still walk in, yet it has good infiltration. Look at all these native species that they have. Look at all the different heights and different textures. And so if you can only imagine just going out there at any time, that would be over one with butterflies, and bees, beetles, birds, all kinds of things. That diversity, nature says that is beautiful. So before I end, let me give you a little food for thought here. I don't know who's familiar with Doug Ptolemy, but I really enjoy him. And so let's read this. That chickadee that wants to breed in your yard that one chickadee requires 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get that one clutch to leave the nest. If you don't have plants that are attracting 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars, you'll never get a chickadee nest. These insects come from the native plants, not from the non-native plants that our insects are unable to eat because they don't have the adaptations to eat them. Crepe myrtles, prime example, they are beautiful. To insects, they mean nothing. So again, I don't mean to be doom and gloom, but we need to get more diversity into our yard and stop viewing a manicured Bermuda yard as beautiful and start viewing one that is diverse and a little bit taller as ecologically beautiful. And so with that, does anyone have any questions? Thank you so much, Jack. Wow, uh, lots of great information, good reminders, but also different ways of thinking through, you know, uh, one thing you said was, you know, you need a living roots in your soil all year long. And uh, it's, it's just a good way of kind of thinking through what you have and how to manage it. So thank you. We do have a lot of questions. So I wanna uh, get to uh, several of these. Um, you know, uh, one of the questions here, uh, several about, um, one is about solarizing. Uh, can you talk about solarizing as an option to get rid of invasive plants uh, which have taken hold of an area? So um, yeah, share a little bit insight there. Sure, okay, solarization. So for the people that aren't familiar with that, what solarization is, is you're basically taking a piece of material and it's usually plastic, 
putting it on the soil and using the sun's energy to help kill those weeds that are underneath it. You're going to raise the temperature so hot underneath there that nothing's going to live. So it's a quite popular practice. There's several different ways to do it. Um, we live in a, uh, a state that it it's quite possible we're very hot. And so the main thing I would recommend if you want to solarize is if you're going to go out to that area before you lay any plastic or anything out over the top, cut that down, mow it as low as you can get it, as close to the soil as possible. Then you're going to wait until the summertime. It usually takes, I'm going to say about three months in order for it to work. And here's the other side. Solarization is good for some of our herbaceous weeds. Some of our more invasive other things, they're more tolerant of those kind of things. And so it might take more effort to get rid of those. But say you've, you're in your front yawn and you want to make a spot for wildflowers. You want to get rid of that Bermuda grass. So you're going to wait until about June. You're going to mow that all the way down as low as you can get. Then you're going to, the area that you're going to choose, you're actually going to make a small trench around it. You're going to lay that plastic out and bury the edges. Once you bury those edges, that seals all that heat and that moisture in it. Then you let the sunlight do its work. And it's usually that fall when you take that plastic off, it's cooked all of those uh, weeds that are on the top. But here's the other side about that. If you're getting the soil, the top one or two inches up to 150 degrees or so to kill those weeds, you are also impacting the microbial community that's on top of that soil. And so there are pluses and minuses with that. Um, I recommend solarization for people that want to do it organically, but certain times, depending on the site and what's actually there, it might not be feasible. And then it's also, we talk about the area. Do we want to do an acre of plastic or are we doing, you know, 10 square feet or what are we doing there? But the main message about solarization is before you put the plastic on, cut it as low as possible. It has to be in the summertime. It usually does not work in the fall because the sun is just not intense enough. Once you place that plastic over, it takes several months in order for it to work, but you still also damage that microbial population. Here's the other side. Once you take that plastic off, don't be surprised if weeds still germinate on there. So you're gonna, if you have wildflower seeds, once you take that plastic off, you're gonna immediately wanna sell them out to get them to compete. And so there's Thank pluses you. and minuses for both. And Thank so you. I've done both, I've sprayed and I've done solarization. So it just depends on how you feel, your time frame, the speed. I mean, there's no one solution that fits all, that's the hard part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, several other questions. Maybe we'll get to one or two more. We'll see. Um, definitely a, a lot of questions here about natural weed control or fertilizer options and or, you know, different types of seeds that might even be better to replace your grass if you don't want to mow and things like that. So, um, yeah, um, what would be some recommendations on natural weed control or fertilizer options that you'd recommend? Okay, so one of the easiest ways for natural weed control is to learn the cycle of the weed, identify the weed, how does it grow? When does it produce seed? Does it produce shoots? How does it spread? And so once you figure it out its timeline, you can interrupt it. And so certain seeds, they'll produce their seeds heads in the spring. What if we mow it before it does that? Or what if we, there's certain practices that we can do. Um, one of the main things you can do is physical. You can physically go out there and remove it. That's always going to be the best option. Some of us don't want to sit out there on a 15,000 square foot and pull Bermuda out by hand. I get it. <laughs> and so there's other things that you can do. You could, if it's Bermuda, you could till the soil lightly right before fall and try to get some of those roots exposed and let that cold temperature uh, kill them. And so the main thing about that is to, that's what we learn from in ag science is you have to, whether it's a pest, 
like some kind of insect, whether it's a pathogen, some kind of disease, or whether it's a weed, you have to identify it correctly first. What is it? Then you get into treatment options. And, and so again, certain ones are better than others. And so I've worked even with um, backpack flamers going out and burning weeds. And so you can do certain things like that. You could um, pour hot water on some. I would stay away from salts and vinegars and some of those other things because you can change the pH of the soil inadvertently. And so the main thing I would say is some sort of physical thing, pulling it, doing something. If you can't do that, then it's some sort of disruption of its life cycle, some kind of mowing, some kind of solarization, some kind of thing. And then as a last resort, it's always a tool in the toolbox. It's like surgery. When we go in, we don't want surgery. That is our last option, but it is still available if we need it. That's what spraying is. Mm. Okay. Oh, well, we, there are so many other questions and unfortunately we're, we're at time, but um, if you can stick around a little bit, Jack, uh, I'm sure, and we'll let people, you know, unmute themselves at, at some point and uh, ask a, a few more really great questions and we invite people to stick around. Uh, thank you so much, Jack. This was a good reminder, especially as people are starting to enjoy uh, things growing in their garden and being more thoughtful about what they're doing and, and how it does impact not just their own, their own beauty of their own yard, but the animals that live around and, and are part of that. So thank you very much. Really appreciate your time and expertise today. Um, if, if you'll take just a moment, everyone, to complete the survey that uh, is going to be shared here, uh, we appreciate that. Again, it'll help us uh, for future um, opportunities. So we're launching that poll. Also uh, wanted to let you know, again, um, first steps, we're in this pilot year we had in our January program, we had a pleasure of hosting Rabbi Mark Boone Fisterman of Congregation B'nai Amuna to share uh, about how the program looks and how to get involved. We still have a few spots. So pilot signups um, will close in August. So if you're interested in working with um, a congregation or a faith community to make environmental and community impacts, please reach out to Missy. She's here today. Send her a note in the text. And Missy, maybe you send a note to everyone, say, um, to, to welcome them to reach out. And additionally, uh, many of you are here today uh, are members of the Scorecard community. And uh, for those who do not know, Scorecard is one of our programs for organizations and businesses that are tracking and improving their sustainability efforts in the areas of people, profit, and planet. So Scorecard has saved organizations millions of dollars every year and provides comprehensive program of resources to support sustainable uh, improvements. So if you'd like to learn more about Scorecard and how it can help your business, please reach out to Teresa Kerrigan. She's here. Uh, she's our Scorecard director and her information is in the chat. So uh, uh, reach out. Um, also, we'll be celebrating all of our Scorecard members on uh, Thursday, July 27th. Um, this year, and we're honored uh, uh, the remarkable success and achievements of our scorecard members during that cycle. Uh, we want to do a, a thank out, a thank you to the Oklahoma Aquarium for sponsoring, uh, being our lead sponsor for this event, and it'll be held there. So it uh, should be uh, exciting to be able to um, enjoy the Oklahoma Aquarium for our celebration. So uh, anyway, stay tuned for that invitation. It'll be coming out uh, very soon. Um, and we'll have, uh, we'll end the evening with some cocktails and some other types of uh, treats. So please uh, join us and look for that invite. Also, if you didn't know, we have our, our own app that's been launched this year is to help you take action on some of the things that Jack was talking about today and the impact uh, that you can have. So download TerraScore today. It's free on Apple and Android devices and learn more about what you can do uh, to live a more sustainable life and, and how to um, work with your family and friends and, and learn more. So uh, that QR code's there. So hey, uh, take a moment and download that. Hey, also we do challenges through uh, this program and, and our latest challenge was a health and wellness that just ended. The challenge brought uh, to you was by Midwest Dairy and uh, Region uh, uh, National Medical Association challenged uh, uh, was a TerraScore uh, user to make an impact on their personal and community health. So 
first place winner was Shauna Ingram, which received a signed Patrick Mahomes uh, football worth uh, as well as a charcuterie board. And it was a value together of over $1,500 for her uh, sustainability efforts. So uh, congratulations to her. And our second and third place winners were Molly and, and Janae. And we also received a charcuterie board and a zero waste starter kit. So congratulations, how exciting. And so keep your eye out for our next challenge uh, that'll be coming out and uh, be able to win some prizes and make a difference as well. So, um, uh, and if you would like to promote a uh, TerraScore challenge, a, a sustainability challenge within your company or your community, reach out uh, to Morgan here in the chat and um, let her know you have an interest in that. It's a great way to really encourage that within your own community and your business culture. So uh, join us for our next uh, first Thursday in July. Uh, this event will be featuring uh, Dr. Habibs uh, from the University of Arkansas, Pine Bluff, who will discuss food positive, a better life one bite at a time. Um, she will be delving into the University of Natural Science Foundation Convergence Accelerator Grant and the innovation and the work that's being done uh, to address specific challenges faced by local communities through this collaboration among governments, nonprofits, and private sector stakeholders. Um, the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff is committed to building trust, introducing data-driven approaches, and making uh, societal impacts, particularly in underserved communities. And this event, excellent opportunity to learn more about this groundbreaking work. So we hope that you will join us and we'll be learning a lot about sweet potatoes. So uh, please uh, join us. I think it's in the, uh, we'll have a link there so you can join us and, and get signed up for that for next month. Um, we also like to extend a special invitation to join us for Recharge in September. Uh, it'll be September 28th. Is, uh, it'll be a captivating evening under the stars and promise to be truly enchanting. And we'll be, um, uh, it'll be exciting. We'll have great food, music, and we'll be promoting uh, this opportunity to get the green ticket. And the green ticket is that uh, if you um, win that ticket, it, it is going to be full of all kinds of sustainability, things that you can implement in your home and get started on your sustainability journey or share with your family and friends. So um, that will be coming up and we hope that you'll join us and, and get your tickets today. It will be delicious and fun. So uh, next there, and you see that in the chat, looks like we, we've shared that there, mark your calendar. Also Monarchs in the Mountain Festival is um, moving this year. So save the day, you'll see uh, see us with Jack and his soil demonstration and station at Chandler Park this year. And that'll be uh, Saturday, September 3rd. So uh, should be a great way to continue this education about how to really protect our uh, native plants and, and um, pollinators. So uh, thank you again to our sponsors, uh, Williams, our neighborhood partners, public service company of Oklahoma, PSO Wind Choice and our community advocates, Cavanta, The Met, One Oak, Save Our Streams, Spirit Era Systems, Tulsa Farmers Market, and Sustainable Advisors Alliance. We thank you so much for your support. And Jack, thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to seeing you around town and helping to protect our yards one at a time. Uh, we'll see you next time on Zoom, July 6th, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you so much for joining us.